talking here. Thank you for uh, being here. Uh, I'm Bogdan. I'm a data engineer with nine years of experience in the data field uh, as a member of uh, various companies or freelance. So uh, one thing you can imagine that is that uh, during this time, I had the chance to see multiple data approaches and different setups which were sold to companies by different vendors. So in 2015, the situation was completely different in the data world, focusing on large servers, trying to get the best out of massive parallel processing architecture. I handled uh, data from bootstrapping in MySQL to data warehousing in actual data warehousing appliances containing hundreds of terabytes of financial data to cloud databases linked with so many APIs one cannot remember all the product, product names those came from. So they all focused on the product. You had to learn to work and even master the product in order to get the best out of data. Uh, well, recently I interacted with a new product, but it's barely a product, practically a uh, utilitary, which introduces a new framework, a new way to look at databases from the data perspective. So, so their unofficial model is simple is powerful. Does a pretty uh, good job explaining the philosophy that went for uh, and is in, uh, in my opinion, a winning one. Because as uh, data analysts and engineers, we always seek affordable tools to get the job done without much sophistication. DBT is one of those tools that has helped engineers by allowing them to work with data in various warehouses more efficiently. It was launched in 2016, but it only, only gained significant adoption within the data community around 2018 and 19. During this time, it began to be recognized as a powerful tool for managing data pipelines and enabling more agile data modeling processes. As data, data themes sought more efficient ways to transform and manage their data within the data warehouses, DBT's features for version control, modularity, testing, and documentation became increasingly appealing, contributing to its widespread adoption. So, in today's presentation, I will do a summary of the uh, uh, first a summary of the modern data stack and what led to it, and then I will proceed to talk more about the functionalities of DBT as a product of it. So, for the agenda today, we have a few minutes about uh, a bit of context over traditional and modern ways to process data, uh, developing in DBT. So, an overview how over how to actually do the work in DBT. Then we're going to dive more into the integrated functionalities that sparked the interest of so many data enthusiasts with testing in DBT. And we will explore types of tests available and how to enforce them. Documenting or and how to build sustainable documentation and how these feature, features became one of the strongest selling points. This is also my favorite <laughs> deployments either in, DPD, in DBT Cloud or using other deployment tools. And last but not least, we'll keep a few minutes for uh, Q&A at the end. So without further ado, uh, in this part, we're gonna, we're gonna cover, cover what steps were taken throughout the years or better, what improvements happened in the engineering world which opened the doors for creation of DBT. There were many limitations in the past with regards to legacy data. So uh, we are going to go step by step and cover the most critical changes, which will point to the direction data engineering and analytics engineering is going. Having an understanding on the past will give a better understanding of today's technologies and maybe the futures as well. So we will start with storage prices back in the day, which, was, which used to be quite expensive. In 1967, a megabyte of storage would have costed, as you see, around $1 million. So when the traditional data integration process, ETL, was introduced in the 70s, it enabled collecting the data from various source systems and loading it into a centralized repository or data warehouse, if you will. The, transform the transformation and normalization typically happened in the staging area before the load, where the deduplication of the data or the cleansing of data were performed. 
As storage prices were high, this was an important step in reducing the amount of data that automatically got loaded and kept inside data warehouse. So, however, over the years, storage prices continue to drop along with the transistor prices, which make up the majority of con uh, components on a CPU. So uh, these train surprises also declined uh, and we ended up with faster internet connection speeds so we could transfer data faster and faster over the network. These three events were critical as they had engineers rethink the processes that existed. Uh, one of the most critical changes that started to shift from the legacy data stack to our today modern stack happened to the data warehouses, and it is closely related to the internet speeds from the previous slide, if you remember. So if you focus your attention on the top left part of the slide, you will see a legacy SMP or a symmetric multiprocessing database design. The SMP multiprocessor system is one in which many processors share resources. So single instances of memory, input-output devices, storage, and the operating systems are examples of these shared resources. These resources are linked via shared bus. The processing occurs in parallel inside the CPU cores while the other system resources are shared. An SMP system consists of a single physical computer with several CPU cores. As you can see on the picture as well, the storage and the compute are tightly coupled. So when it comes to scalability, SMP systems can only be scaled up or scaled vertically. This means that I can add more disk to a computer or more CPU. However, the problem is that there are limitations as to how much I can fit into one machine. The benefits of these SMP systems were that the processing happened on the same machine close to storage, which led to faster processing times. Yet, the SMP architecture has its limitation, like it is restricted to only vertical scaling and the need to keep backs backups of your data. The reason why you could not store data in a distributed manner or on multiple, on multiple machines was that they simply did not have the distribution, uh, distributed routing technologies that we have today. Thus, thus, data transmission over the network was not exactly fast, if you remember. <laughs> However, since distributed systems and routing technologies evolved and the data transmission speeds over the network got a lot better, it opened the doors towards MPP, or in other words, multi-parallel processing database architecture. Uh, these systems are made up of a master node and many compute nodes that do not share memory. Each node is equipped it with its own operating system and the master node is in charge of coordinating the operations among the compute nodes and communicates with them over a high-speed messaging interface. Storage can be shared or not, so this is entirely up to you. And the uh, architecture is referred to be shared storage or shared nothing MPP architecture. Shared nothing MPP is the most common MPP design. There is no difference across the, uh, the systems. Every node has its own memory and disk storage and data is spread between the nodes. Depending on the distribution mechanism employed, data from a single table may, may spend many nodes and each node only processes, processes the data rows on its related disk for processing. To increase scalability, we may add more nodes which associate with associated memory and disk storage, which is known as horizontal scaling or scaling out. You would connect to a master node as a user or an application via JDBC or ODBC, and the master node would coordinate the distribution process. Uh, our today cloud data warehouses all have an underlying MPP architecture such as you can also see uh, Azure Synapse, AWS, Redshift, BigQuery, or Snowflake. So the shift from the SMP to MPP was a critical step towards the modern data stack. Another important step was the decoupling of storage and compute. Uh, as with multiple processing architecture, the control or the master node can evaluate requests from businesses or analytics application and direct them to compute nodes for processing. 
If you look closely at this design, you can see that computing is only required when a request is made by the business or analytical applications. So you can basically shut down the compute nodes when you don't need them and your data will be safe inside the low cost storage system such as Amazon S3 or Azure Blob Storage. It also lets you scale your compute very dynamically. So if you have a very compute in intensive workload, you can just add more compute to your cluster without having to scale the storage. Another step that happened and really contributed to the modern data stack was the creation of, or introduction of column-oriented databases. So in row-oriented databases, on the other hand, uh, data is arranged by record. So storing all of the data associated with the re uh, record is done in, me uh, in memory together. So row-oriented databases are the combination technique of arranging data and uh, they continue to offer some important advantages for storing data fast. Typically, these row-oriented databases are designed to be efficient when it comes to writing or reading rules. So we would still want to use these row-oriented databases in OLTP databases like PostgreSQL or MySQL. However, it turns out that oriented databases are not exactly good for analytical workloads. So column oriented databases were designed and introduced as they arrange data by fields, storing all the data associated with a field in memory. Columnar databases have increased in popularity because they improve query performance. So they are optimized for efficient column reading and computation. If you look at the picture on the left side, you can see that if you want to sum up the number of cells in a row-oriented database, we would need to load the entire table. Yet in a column store, we would just simply load the cells column without having to load the entire table. And this is the beauty of the column-oriented databases. Plus, they just require less input and output operations and can make query times a lot faster. So they are a great match for all app-based databases and our MPP cloud data warehouses today are all columnar. Because of the MPP becoming oriented and decoupled cloud data warehouses, we are now able to shift away from ETL, extract, transform, load, data integ integration, the traditional process, towards extract load transform or ELT. What is important to highlight here is that the steps that we discussed were inevitable throughout the years for us to be able to do ELT today. So if you look at this picture, you will see a typical ELT implemented with tools that we have in the modern data stack. Fivetran and Stitch are one of the most popular extracts and load tools that we have available today. The transformation layer sits on top of a cloud data warehouse and it uses DBT. You may have Locker as a BI tool, for example, and Census for reverse ETL. Now, the modern data stack really is structured differently than the traditional legacy tools. For example, in a traditional data stack, your BI tool would not only do visualization, but would all it would also act as a data warehouse and would have storage integrated. So you would have done everything in your BI tool. And these tools were massive and complicated. So we can say that they were a group of layers that were vertically integrated since they have storage, uh, since they acted as data warehouse and you did a visualization in them as well. But the modern data stack really flatters this out. And the modern data stacks is, is a horizontally integrated set of tools that are fully managed, that are uh, in the cloud and that are cheap and easy to use. And because corporation realize that data is a product of, of itself, uh, we now see that DevOps tool and practices are crawling into this modern data stack space and are gaining a lot of popularity. We do the data engineering and analytics engineering that follow software engineering and DevOps best practices today. So the modern data stack is just the product productization of different layers of the data integration flow. So DBT productionized the T in ELT. They came up with DBT as a tool to do the transformation inside the data warehouse.
Okay. So, uh, we move now to the next part, developing with the DBT, which is a large topic itself. I don't want to say we are going to just scratch the surface because we should have the motto in our heads. In our heads, simplicity is key, but we do need to divide it in order to focus on the most important individual components. So we're going to discuss uh, how to set up a project, what are materializations and what are models. So this is for developing or moving on <laughs> with the rest later. So uh, the project setup can be a bit rocky, especially if you don't have CLI experience or you are not familiar with JSON files. First thing we need to do is make, uh, make sure Python is installed. Checking the version is always a good way to make sure we have Python installed. And also we can check that our version of Python is greater than 3.8, which is the lowest version that is supported by dbt. A virtual environment, a separate environment for, uh, for a Python project is highly recommended in order not to install Python packages system-wide. From there, a simple pip install will do the trick. Since I'm using uh, Snowflake as a data warehouse against which I am executing the models, I naturally use the dbt Snowflake connector. But there are also connectors for Redshift, BigQuery, Databricks, Mac, Microsoft Fabric, or PostgreSQL. Uh, from here, we only need to create a dbt folder inside the home folder, and then we can create a project. Inside the dbt folder, we can find the uh, profiles.yaml file where the project connection details will be saved after the project is created, of course. To create a project, dbt init command is used, followed by the name of the project. Fill in the details of our data warehouse and we're good to go. Uh, there is also a thread set up where the program asks you how many threads you want to use. This means that when you execute dbt and there are multiple parallel transformation that dbt can run, how many dbt should use in parallel. It might matter for larger projects when you need to decide how much you want to overload the data warehouse, but for learning purposes, one is enough. So uh, we say like one transformation at a time. Okay, so now, we can take a look inside the project structure, which was created. We can see we have a lot of folders, which we will keep, uh, we, which is where we will keep our models, where we define the test, where we can install packages or place files that are to be imported are as static tables. We call those seeds. But we also, as you can see, we have a, a dbt project.yaml file. So, this file is very important because this is the global configuration for the project. Oh, sorry. We can see a lot of important information starting from the project name, the version of the project or an, or an internal configuration version. But we can also see the configuration of the folders that we see on the left. Uh, we define here what gets stored where. Uh, these are standard project configurations, but starting from line 34 downwards, we have some special model configurations. Here we decide if our models would be will be persisted as tables, views, incremental for table appends. Uh, there we are, we have incremental uh, tables recommended or ephemeral, which are basically CTEs. So. Moving on to materialization. There are four built-in materialization, which can be configured at the project level. As we just saw in the dbt project that, uh, that YAML file or at the model level. In each of these files, we create, uh, we create for the models. So view is the default one. And of course there are pros and cons uh, against it. Those of you who have some data warehouses uh, data housing experience, you already know that views uh, are, uh, are are common if you don't reuse data too often or uh, uh, if you want a lightweight representation so not to store data in multiple places. So, uh, but they're a bad idea if you read from, uh, uh, from the say, uh, same model several times. Uh, so, 
tables for the table materialization if you pick it pick it every time we run the model it will get recreated so but the the data is persisted into the data warehouse so if you read from this model repeatedly it's a good idea to use it but if you have uh, for example single use models or uh, your model is incrementally populated that's not a good idea for incremental populated we have a incremental materialization which is uh, which is more proper so that's that's appropriate for fact tables or uh, appends but not that appropriate for very large data loads like uh, historical records update or such um, the last materialization is the ephemeral materialization which is pretty much a virtual materialization it means that if we have an uh, ephemeral model will actually be a city that will not be persistent uh, persisted in the database but will get saved as as a model in uh, uh in our uh in our project so what are the models actually so it's pretty simple it's so simple that i won't take much of the time explaining models are sql queries saved in sql files in the models folder they can uh, reference each other so dbt knows semantic dependencies between them and also scripts and macros can be used inside them so last but not least, they are written in the combination of SQL and Jinja, which is a templating language used in the Python ecosystem. So uh, ref, as you can see, invoke here, has, instead of selecting the, the uh, schema and table name, we use a referral to the, to the model name. So ref is a function that dbt gives to users within their Jinja context to reference other data models. Ref does two things. As I said, it interpolates itself into the raw SQL as the appropriate schema.table for the supplied model. And this is uh, this is like super important because it automatically builds a directed cyclic graph of all of the models in a given DB a dbt project you will see later in the documentation what i mean both of these are core to the way that dbt operates because dbt is interpolating the location of all of these models it generates it allows user to easily create dev and prod environments and seamlessly transition between the two and because dbt natively understand the dependencies between all models it can do powerful things like run models in dependency order or parallelize model builds and run arbitrary subgraphs defined in its model selection syntax. So this is it about the models. We are now moving to testing. Data testings are essential uh, assertions we uh, make about the models and other resources in the dbt project. Uh, so uh, we can uh, test sources, seeds, snapshots, all other objects that exist. When we run dbt test command, we will tell if each test uh, in the project passes or fails. So we can use data test to improve the integrity of the SQL in each model by making assertions about the results generated. Out of the box, you can test whether a specified column in a model only contains non-null values, unique values, or values that have a corresponding value in another mod model. For example, a customer ID uh, for an order corresponds uh, to an ID in the customer's model, and values from a specified list. You can extend data test to suit business logic specific to any organization. So any assertion that we can make about the model in the form of a select query can be turned into a data test. Uh, data test return a set of failing records. Generic data tests or schema tests are defined using test blocks. Uh, a singular data test is uh, testing in its simplest form. If you can write this, an SQL query that return, returns 
failing rows, you can save that query as an SQL file in the test directory and is now a data test and it will be executed by the dbt test command. So uh, a generic data test is a parameterized query that accepts arguments. The test query is defined in a special test block like a macro. Once defined, you can reference the generic test by name throughout your YAML files and define it on models, columns, sources, snapshots, or seeds. dbt ships with four generic data tests built in. Uh, I think I already mentioned it, them, but these are unique, not null, accepted values, and relationships. Okay, so moving to the documentation, the documentation in dbt refers to the process of automatically generating and maintaining documentation for the data models and transformation. This documentation serves as a valuable resource for data analysts, engineers, and other stakeholders to understand the structure, logic, and dependencies for the data within a dbt project. So if you wanna maintain a description uh, for the models and columns, this will be automatically integrated in the larger project documentation, which is generated using the uh, command line interface. Uh, larger or, uh, or more explicit documentation can be uh, maintained using the markdown files. And uh, these files are also available for integration in the project schema.yaml file. Okay, so dbt's lightweight documentation web server serves as our central hub for understanding and navigating data transformations within the project. This feature automatically generates and hosts compressive documentation for our data models, making it easily accessible for all team members. The documentation provides crucial insights into the structure and logic for each data model, including column descriptions, data lineage, and dependencies. With its intuitive interface, we can effortlessly explore the relationship between different models, enhancing our understanding of the data pipeline architecture. Moreover, the documentation web server in the in dbt offers customization options allows us to tailor the documentation to suit our specific needs we can add additional context to our model such as explanations of the business logics or data sources making the documentation more informative and uh, actionable in the end so this is how it looks uh, you can select your objects which are automatically documented into this uh, into this uh, uh, local server. So uh, now I saved the best for last uh, for last. Directed acyclic graphs. They are uh, an integral part to the documentation that is generated. They are they are actually uh, started uh, action by here by this little button. So they correlate the data from uh, from source to uh, to uh, the serving uh, uh, to the serving layer in a very very uh, explicit manner. So they play uh, uh, an essential role in illustrating the sequence of data transformation within our projects. These visual representations provide a clear and intuitive overview of how data flows through the pipeline from source to destination. By visually ma mapping out dependencies between different models and transformations, DEGs help us understand the logical order in which data transformations occur. This understanding is crucial for maintaining data integrity and ensuring that each transformation occurs in the correct sequence, avoiding errors or inconsistencies in our analysis. Furthermore, furthermore, DAGs in dbt documentation serve as a valuable tool for collaboration and communication within the data teams. They provide a common language for discussing and planning data pipelines, enabling team members to easily visualize and comprehend the, data, the flow of data. The shared understanding fosters efficient collaboration as team members can quickly identify dependencies, 
troubleshoot issues and coordinate efforts to improve and iterate on the data pipeline. Ultimately, DAGs enhance transparency and facilitate, facilitate effective teamwork, empowering the data teams to work cohesively towards uh, achieving our data-driven objectives. This very long paragraph is a very long way to, to say uh, they are human readable. So on this last chapter, let's assume that we have a working project which is deployed to production and which updates with each run, uh, with each run, models, test, snapshot, and so on. Well, if you ask me, that sounds like a perfect candidate to orchestrate, but having so many orchestration tools, picking the right one is never an easy cho choice. We can use Apache Airflow since this is open source. Actually, the first big orchestration tool, already very popular and very good uh, match to integrate with dbt. This would be a very good fit if we value finding a lot of documentation and uh, Stack Overflow answers. The downside is that Airflow is not that user-friendly as others are, but there are also some other disadvantages since the pool of commands that are available to orchestrate from Apache Airflow is very, is very limited. So uh, we can la launch tasks, but we can't explore the failures. And in my opinion, this is very important. Uh, luckily, there are also other newer tools which might seem friendlier to interact with, like Perfect or Dexter. Perfect is an ETL tool uh, with a much friendlier interface, which is able to run Python code. The integration between uh, Perfect and dbt is quite simple. It has capabilities of integration with both dbt core and dbt cloud, but it's still limited in terms of logging information. Uh, there are also proprietary offerings like Azure Data Factory, which is very, uh, which has a very extensive integration capability. Uh, it's pretty much point and click, but again, it's only capable to run models and nothing more. So it's easy to set up, but it doesn't give too much context. So dbt cloud uh, from the dbt labs, uh, this is the proprietary solution. Here we can create jobs over a cron top schedule, uh, which uh, we can specify it and we can set up what commands are to be given. So uh, this would be uh, up to now the tires integration since we can run different types of commands or parts or models individually. So uh, Dexter is, uh, is another great dbt orchestrator. It has a concept of asset. Uh, very similar to a dbt model, a great user interface with metrics provided and great capabilities in terms of range or uh, a range of dbt uh, commands. It can, uh, yeah, it can run. One of the most appreciated features about Dexter integration with dbt is the ability to provide meaningful error messages, which is a very high value attribute. So. Uh, in connection to to uh, open source, to being open source, uh, I think Dexter would be the uh, most appropriate solution uh, when trying to orchestrate in a in a new project. So uh, I guess uh, this was it from uh, from my side. Uh, now this slide signifies the beginning of the Q and A session. If you have any Q and A, uh, any Qs, I might have some A's. Yeah. I hope I wasn't speaking on mute this whole time. No, no, you weren't. So, so do we have questions? Let me draw one star, please. Yep, thank you. So I had a quick question about the orchestration, and you mentioned that. DBT doesn't have a built-in on orchestration, and you need to schedule this, this job from some external tool, right? So DBT uh, DBT Core doesn't have an orchestrator. DBT Core is the the open source project, but DBT Cloud, which is a solution uh -huh. that integrates with DBT Core, yeah, that has the 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 orchestration part. Yeah, but and which the, you would but you recommend. have to pay for DBT Cloud. Yeah, yeah, of course. And which you would recommend. I mean, I mean, you said that Dexter is the best, but DBT Cloud is also nice. So, 
for the new to for the completely new setup of the dbt which is preferable well for a new setup of a, of a dbt uh, in the first instance you do not need an orchestrator for uh, after some time after you developed uh, and you have a working uh, production environment that's where when you would need uh, 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 an orchestrator but uh, uh, if you are looking to experiment, yeah, Dexter, since is uh, is free, or even uh, uh, Apache, if you are uh, if you are just experimenting, if you just need to run. Uh, but yeah, the the DBT Cloud is the is the most appropriate if you have the budget for it, and for it also has this uh, new uh, new functionality which was launched a few couple. Uh, weeks ago, which is deferred to products, uh, deferred to production, and uh, yeah, that uh, that uh, really smooths out uh, also uh, uh, different uh, different environments that uh, that are used within the the project. Perfect. Thank you. And sorry, one more question, really quickly to the same topic. And you mentioned that Airflow has some cons because it doesn't support the failure observability that well that's because these like the methods for the observability are not developed yet or because dbt doesn't return the appropriate failure oh, DBT, response uh, i think dbt uh, returns but they are not picked up by the by the airflow it has like more general approach over over several tools tools oh, okay got it thank you because uh, since dexter uh uh is also an uh, an open source tool and uh uh yeah it, it can provide the the logs perfect perfect thank you yeah, and I will proceed to the back yep hello everyone my question will be since we are mixing sql statements with jinja templates from our experience, is there a language server protocol that helps us with any auto completions, error validations, and so on? Because it's something custom, right? Mixing Jinja with SQL that can trigger unexpected behavior. Uh, yeah, there is. There are uh, different uh, different tools. So, uh, uh, Virtual Studio Code has has a, a template integrated for coding. Uh, with uh, with Jinja that can uh, auto complete statements, but uh, what yeah what uh, is pretty important and I forgot to mention is that all the code the Jinja code is compiled into SQL code. So you can uh, upon uh, when you have an error you can investigate and uh, the, in most of the cases you will investigate the the compiled code and that is full SQL. So it's Jinja translated to to SQL. Jinja is there. To 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 take care of the of the uh, of the naming convention and uh, uh, the links between there for uh, for the for the documentation part. Okay, thank you. Welcome. So first question, I think I'm going to add from you in the class. You can tell me an environment, how would it look like for the document and see you at class tomorrow. I'm sorry, Adriana, I can't uh, hear you, but let me stop the screen and check the chat myself. Uh, Dev, how would it look like for production in a team where a customer is deployed to a VM or Kubernetes? Okay. Uh, yeah. So, uh, so, uh, so, yeah. It's not. It's nothing like uh, like Spark SQL. So the execution itself, uh, it uh, it it's done is done in. Uh, uh, in the data warehouse of your choice, it it, it may be uh, on the on the Spark, but is I, I'm trying to find a correspondent myself for it, but I I can't have it's something of a Git combined to uh, uh, of a repository combined with the the execution capabilities. So that is the the closest thing I would compare it compare it to, uh, 
Yeah, okay, because... so there's a push down to the database and it's not executed on your setup where dpt runs or the repo you showed. Uh, sorry, yeah, uh, what? Uh, the SQLs are pushed down to the data warehouse. So if you operate yeah. on top of Snowflake, the operations yeah. are executed at data warehouse level and yes. not on the machine which runs dpt. Indeed, indeed, indeed. So it can run on Spark, basically. <laughs> yeah, it can uh, run on uh, Databricks. So yeah, that's mostly Spark. Thank you. So uh, how would it look for a uh, production in a team at a customer uh, environment? So uh, yeah. Uh, Every so developer that... had just this repo you showed locally um, mm -hmm. and clone it from the Git repo. Or would this project being hosted somewhere in a corresponding cloud? Yeah. So no, there, there, there is a, this project is actually a repo that is, uh, that is, uh, where you have to create your, your branch and, uh, and do your own, uh, uh, modification. And then you, uh, you, you, uh, merge it with the main and everyone does that in their own, uh, in their own, uh, project, which they have it set up in the same way, uh, on their, on their machines. So, okay. uh, so yeah, the, the whole project is not, is not, uh, in your computer only. This is a repo that is uh, that is also connected to to uh, GitHub in my experience. Okay. Uh, and and also yeah, it, it, uh, regarding the environments, it has uh, it has the capabilities to to deploy to a developer uh, environment, which is basically your own schema where you do your modifications, or to production. Schema where uh, where everyone can can see the alterations that uh, that you've made, but that on the on the data warehouse side, yeah, at the project level, it's it's a repo. Do we have other questions? If not, I think we may, uh, yes. yes. Another uh, question, yeah. Bad cases and how you will avoid it in the future. Uh, bad cases, uh, like uh, bad practices. Uh, okay, okay. Uh, bad practices. Oh, yeah, there are a lot of of uh, of uh, best uh, practices when you are uh, when you are uh, writing your models. So uh, the models, uh, I said there are SQL statements, but they should all be uh, integrated uh, uh, inside uh, CTE. Also, there is a, a specific uh, linting that uh, that needs to be used. Uh, when you are using dbt cloud uh, uh, the linting it, it has a button and uh, the linting is put in place uh, uh, by the uh, uh, by the program for you but uh, in case not it will uh, it will uh, uh, frown upon your uh, linting but yeah you can uh, you can uh, get over that these are the first two cases uh, that I can think of, but, but, but yeah. The documentation looks like a good starting point to populate data governance exploration systems. Do you know about projects where DBT artifacts were used in data governance systems? Uh, no, 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 I did not. <laughs> Thank you, but yeah, we can uh, uh, usually, so uh, what I encountered in the past was that uh, the data lineage was generated, uh, yeah, through such uh, data governance uh, systems. So yeah, indeed, I, I see your point that it's, uh, uh, is super useful and can do uh, a lot more than than provide a very good understanding of the of the data, but uh, as of my experience, I only used it for that for understanding data like uh, really good. 
Yeah, because because uh, the diagrams of uh, line of transformation dex is is very very like uh, like lineage uh, lineage between yeah. data sources. Yeah. 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 And this is this is amazing that we only now get this. And personally, I was wondering where was this all of my <laughs> data engineering life this should this is how all database should should have uh, the lineage thank you thank you any other questions If not, thank you all. Thank you for joining. Uh, we are right on time, so that's perfect. Uh, yeah, yeah, I hope you got something from uh, from this. I hope I wasn't too too fast. So uh, yeah, maybe see you next time. Thank I, I you should say it, it 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 was beautiful, be beautiful presentation, very fast and all to the point. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Andre. Thank, Thank you very much for the performance. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. All the materials will be shared with you. Uh, wishing everyone a great stay ahead. Thank, Thank you, you once more, Bogdan. Thank you. Bye-bye.